The Industrial Revolution that started two and a half centuries ago has brought radical changes in human lives. What are these changes? In other words, what are the main consequences of this revolution? The most direct consequence was an intended one, an ongoing growth of labor productivity, that is, of the production per working hour. For example, while an Indian hand spinner in the 18th century needed about 1000 hours to spin one kilogram of cotton, this was reduced to three hours in 1820 with an advanced steam engine. All kinds of products became much cheaper in terms of the labor time needed to produce them or to buy them. And this went hand in hand with an overall increase of material prosperity. Beyond this direct effect, the Industrial Revolution had much larger consequences, which went far beyond any individual human intention or control. These consequences are related to the three basic causes that I distinguished, and they can be ordered in the same way – ecological, technological and social. The Industrial Revolution had far-reaching ecological consequences. It brought an enormous intensification of the human exploitation of non-human nature. In 1750, the Earth had to sustain less than 800 million people. Today, this number has increased to more than 7,000 million or 7 billion, with a much higher consumption of goods and energy per head of population. One consequence is that total carbon emission due to burning fuels increased more than a hundredfold, with severe impacts on the global climate, as we have come to know, to come to know only recently. Secondly, the Industrial Revolution induced an enormous acceleration of technological change, driven by competition between private firms as well as national states. Improvements of the steam engine were followed by the invention and application of a new, more efficient machine, the combustion engine, which substituted oil for coal as energy source and was increasingly used for trains and ships as well as new means of transportation, cars and airplanes. The decades around 1900 also saw the increasing use of electricity with a variety of applications and the emergence of a large-scale chemical industry. This acceleration of technological innovation had positive and negative effects. Part of it was an enormous increase of the destructive force of weapons, as became apparent in the two world wars of the 20th century. Thirdly, while the Industrial Revolution was conditioned by market capitalism, it in turn strengthened this system of production. It enhanced the power and wealth of the class of the industrial bourgeoisie, it increased the size of the industrial working class. It extended the organization of production in capitalist firms. It induced an almost continuous expansion of international traffic, trade and capital movements. It brought the mechanization of agriculture, which reduced the number of farmers and agrarian workers and thereby induced massive urbanization. The Industrial Revolution also had important political consequences, as national states took more and more responsibility in creating favorable conditions for industrial growth. They did so, for example, by constructing roads and railroads and harbors, by organizing and financing public education, and by regulating working conditions. In Russia, since the revolution of 1917, the state took an even more active role by abolishing private property and directly organizing industrial production through central planning. This alternative communist system seemed quite successful for a while, but eventually its productive performances remained far below those of the richer capitalist societies. And in the 1980s the system collapsed. Today. 
The capitalist mode of production based on private property and profit orientation is hardly challenged anymore. As I said, the most direct consequence of the Industrial Revolution is a strong increase of labor productivity and a co concomitant growth of material prosperity. But what I did not say yet is that this overall rising material prosperity was and still is very unequally distributed. In the first stages of industrialization, material inequality became even larger. The rising prosperity largely went to the upper and middle classes, the capitalists and landowners, not to the exploited industrial workers, who suffered from extremely long work days and awful living conditions. In the second half of the 19th century, in the advanced industrializing societies, working conditions began to improve and wages to rise. And in the 20th century, overall income inequality diminished in these societies. It was particularly in the first three decades after the Second World War that these societies combined high economic growth with decreasing class inequalities. The rich countries of the West turned into welfare states and mass consumption societies in which the vast majority of the population lived far above the subsistence level. But the story is quite different when we look at the world as a whole. The Industrial Revolution brought a continuous increase of already existing inequality between the Western capitalist countries and other regions in the world, many of which were colonies exploited by Western powers, serving as suppliers of food and raw materials for Western industrial production. The decolonization in the second half of the 20th century did not stop the, this increase of global inequality. On the contrary, the gap between the rich and the poor, or the so-called developed and underdeveloped countries, grew even wider than ever before. So, there were two inequality trends in the 20th century. A decrease of income and wealth inequalities within rich countries and an increase of inequality between the rich and the poor countries. But since about 1980 we see a reversal of both these trends. Inequality within the rich countries and in many poor countries as well tends to increase again. On the other hand, economic growth in poor countries is on average higher than those in the rich countries, so that overall inequality between countries is somewhat narrowing, and more people in the world are lifted out of utmost poverty. Both tendencies are related to globalization processes, in which financial and physical capital moves quickly around the world, corporations become transnational, investing in different countries, and industrial production is relocated from rich to poorer countries. Yet, global inequality is still dramatic, and in spite of all technological progress and the rise in production capacity, most people in the world still live near the absolute poverty line of mere subsistence. Throughout human history, humanity has grown in terms of population, power and production. This long-term trend, extending over thousands of years, has accelerated in the past 250 years as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. It confronts us with new problems. Today, two problems are crucial. How to maintain overall production and consumption levels in the face of the depletion of natural resources, global warming and the necessary transition from the use of fossil fuels to other sources of energy? And secondly, how to distribute the results of our combined technological capacities in more even, fairer, more balanced way, 
both on national and international levels, within countries and between countries. These are core questions that we will have to cope with in the decades to come.